Today we're going to talk about O.J. Simpson. A lot of you may not know who he is, but we get a lot of requests for him, and there's um, we've got a pretty good idea about what happened here. But Greg's come up with a brilliant idea to keep this from being boring and being different, and we're going to take it from an approach no one has taken before. Greg, why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, let's start off by who O.J. Simpson is. 1968 Heisman Award winner when he played for USC. Then he became an NFL guy for 11 years, 11 seasons. He still holds records that have not been beaten since the 60s and 70s today. He then became a movie and TV guy with 35 appearances. He was an icon. His name was Elvis. I mean, he was a single name and you knew who you were talking about. So he was a big deal. And then in 1992, I believe is the date, 94 maybe, there was a murder, 94. There was a murder of his wife, estranged wife, and a man at her house. He was tried for that. He was found not guilty at trial. And then these two videos come out of 1996, two years after the murder, and 2006, 10 years later. What we're going to do is look at a base. We'll start off with a video that is one question. We are not going to comment on that until the very end of the show. So you get to compare that to what we're doing. Then we'll go to a baseline in 96 and run through some videos of him talking about the murders. Then we'll go to a baseline of 2006 and look at his story, the hypothetical. And then we'll finally wrap up with the beginning. So long, long story for what we're gonna do, but that's it. Did you kill Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman? Absolutely not. I couldn't kill anyone. I couldn't do it. All right, here we go. OJ, before we start to unravel this bizarre odyssey that uh, you have gone through, why are you doing this interview? Why did you agree to this interview under these circumstances? Well, uh, I think obviously uh, it's well known that I've been wanting to talk uh, for quite a while. My, uh, when the case was over, uh, I wanted to talk immediately. Unfortunately, um, I had some new lawyers, and I was involved in another litigation, this civil suit. Uh, they had some concerns because they hadn't really spent any time with me. They had a lot of concerns uh, that uh, anything I might say may be used against me and not knowing me and not uh, understanding uh, uh, how I see things and how I speak and uh, uh, really not, even though they followed the case, not being totally up on the case. they were. They were a little reluctant for me to speak at that time. So was most of my lawyers. They felt that mm-hmm. that I was at a time where I was still coming down from an emotional, mm-hmm. you know, this emotional thing. Are you um, doing this for the money too? Oh, obviously. For obviously, uh, I uh, I've spent a career collecting a, a certain uh, wealth. Uh, I've a lot of people have relied on me over those years, uh, family, in-laws, and uh, and I've had to use all that up, all those savings up. Uh, Uh, to defend myself. Uh. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a good baseline because this is a way he talks in every interview. Now, he's obviously a little apprehensive about his image. As we said, he was an icon, and you can see that in his body language as well. But he starts off by illustrating with his face. You'll see him move his face a lot as he's talking, and he'll raise his brow up when he's asking for how you're perceiving him. That's not deception. That's request for approval at how he's perceived. He's got internal voice that down left looking down left and down right emotional as he's talking about this. He stresses words, new lawyers, another litigation. We're gonna see this later as he things matter to him, he stresses them. And then as he looks at hadn't spent time with me, he's all those things are things that matter to him. This is him telling you what happened. This is baseline. He enunciates key words more strongly against me, not knowing me. And then if you walk through just a handful of other things here, he punctuates with his head, He's dismissive with a smile when he wants to get away from something. And his cadence and illustrators are all congruent. All his messaging is going here. His eye contact's about 50-50. Great baseline to start. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, a great, a great baseline. And keep in mind as we're going forward, this is also a baseline that we're seeing for something that he has been rehearsing for years and something that he's been talking about in court. So this is after his court appearance. But right when the reporter says, why did you agree to do this? There's a shift in his eyes to moving down to internal dialogue, which is kind of like when we go down and left with our eyes. If you talk to yourself in your head, that's kind of what you're doing. And with the eye accessing thing, when you see it on TV and stuff where they say people are lying because of it, that's not true. 
but this is a good point to note. And there's lip compression instead of saying the word attorney or lawyer here. So I think that we're seeing some negatives around legal teams and lawyers, and we'll, we'll see that repeat itself. There's a quick eye flutter here right there when he's answering the, why did you agree to this? Which is kind of what we do as humans when we want to quit apps. We want to basically close a bunch of apps. We're thinking about a bunch of stuff and we need to close all those apps so we can focus on something else. That's kind of what we're seeing here. And the when he says emotional thing, when that when that topic comes up, there's a, kind of an interesting tumbler washing machine uh, gesture that comes up. And I think we might see that again. And you can look for that. Scott, what do you think? All right. I think you're, I agree with both of you guys. This is a great baseline. He's relaxed. He comes out. If you listen real close, you can hear the guy. You can hear the director telling him what's happening. And then you hear him go, action. And the guy starts asking questions, if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, so his illustrators are, are fairly simple, and they're they're right right where they should be. Everything looks as it should look. Everything is as it should, as it should be. Uh, he doesn't look too stressed. He doesn't look too worried. But he's putting on, his addiction is almost perfect here. We're going to see that degrade as we go along. So he's got his big show face on right here um, of, of how he wants everybody to see him. And he's, especially when he says, talk. He says, I've been wanting to talk. It's, and you can hear him throwing on his show voice for that. So these kind of things are interesting because he's, again, managing perception of how he looks and how he sounds. He wants to come off like, yeah, yeah, yeah this, is, this is the OJ show. Everything's clean and I'm good. And, but, as we, but again, as we see this uh, further down, we see this degrade. And what, what will keep popping up is this weird little smile with a fake laugh as we go along. So that's one of his little, it's almost his, his body language trademark at this point. So Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so let's just kind of frame it up. He walks in there, as we saw. Uh, Chase was saying as we were watching that that he loves the swagger there. I agree. Uh, there's a, there's this. So he knows he's on show, and and so that's part of the baseline. It's not a mystery to him. This is this is part of show business. He swaggers in. Love it when he sits down and maneuvers himself, but he has a real kind of push forward with with one of his shoulders there. I th I think there's a frame of a little bit of aggression. There. He doesn't really need to push forward so hard with the shoulder. I think there's something psychological and aggressive going on there. We can understand why he's going to get some hard questions coming along. So that's 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 there's a, that's reasonable, uh, I think. Uh, maybe a touch of arrogance as well as the chin kind of comes up again. I think that's reasonable under the circumstances, under the questioning that's going on. Um, yeah, he is super clear about which words he's stressing with his volume and with his elongation and often with an eyebrow raise and a look for approval. So as people have said before, we get new lawyers, didn't know me, time, family, um, uh, wealth. He's very clear about the things that are most important, most valuable to him. That's worth checking out. But as an overall within that frame, I would suggest we see a baseline of calm, assertive, and actually gentle. There's a real calm, assertive, very gentle nature to him, relaxed. So it's worth kind of thinking about and looking at the texture of that in your mind and going to everything we see from now on and going, well, how much does it fit that calm, assertive, gentle texture that we've seen from him? That's what I got on that one. Hey, let me add one more comment here. If you are a fan of eye movement, buckle up. This is a fantastic eye movement study. And I'm going to, I will lean heavily into eye movement on this one. You can't miss it. All right. Unless Scott calls on me first. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, how I see things and how I speak and uh, uh, really not, even though they followed the case, not being totally up on the case, they were they were a little reluctant for me to speak at that time. So was most of my lawyers. They felt that mm -hmm. that I was at a time where I was still coming down from an emotional, mm -hmm. you know, this emotional thing. Are you um, doing this for the money too? Oh, obviously. For obviously, uh, I uh, I've spent a career collecting a, a certain uh, wealth. Uh, I've a lot of people have relied on me over those years, uh, family, in-laws, and uh, and I've had to use all that up, all those savings up. Uh, uh, to defend myself. Uh. But the coincidences still remain. Okay. Uh, again, uh, you know, whether it's yours or not, mm -hmm. the contention, your blood at the crime scene, your blood, coincidence, here at Rockingham found the same night of uh, that the crime happened, well, and in the Bronco. Well, in, if in fact that was my blood here at the home, mm -hmm. if in fact it was, I don't find that to be well, such was a coincidence. It? Was it? I don't think so, but I don't find How that to be a coincidence. How did it get here, okay. How did it get here? Whose blood was it here at Rockingham? If, in fact, it was mine, if, in fact, it was mine, I live here at Rockingham. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you're going to be surprised at how little blood is involved in this, this bloody home that I hear. It's three no, there were, there of were blood, drops of blood. Drops of blood on the driveway. Yeah. If, in fact, it happened, if, in fact, I deposited it, it would have not been certainly not after leaving Nicole's house because I hadn't been in Nicole's house and maybe when I was running around I really had absolutely no answer for that. Mm -hmm. I, I personally I am very skeptical about whose blood that was. Uh, Chase, what do you got? But right away we see a chin drop, just a small amount during this when the question is revealed, the topic of the question, and then how did it get here? And right there, he kind of moves to a potentially visual accessing. So maybe picturing what's going on there. And when he's saying, I live here at Rockingham, uh, there's some fading facts, which I hope uh, Scott talks about uh, when he just his volume goes way down right there. Uh, he almost says after leaving Nicole's house right there. <laughs> and there is a big eyebrow flash right there. And there's some narrowing of the eyes to kind of bring the interviewer into focus to ensure that uh, he can continue without worrying about this, this lapse in his speech. And the last thing here, I think when he says, if in fact I deposited it, I think that's an interesting word choice. And I think he's carried a very litigious mentality from court. And he's, he's learned a lot of these, these words doing this. And this also starts a trend here of unusual eye accessing, maybe for him, where he goes to nine o'clock. So if you, this is your first video watching this, he's going to your nine o'clock as you're looking at the screen. This might be his baseline. So let's keep an eye out, no pun intended, in the next few videos to see where his eye home is. Where does he normally go to access truthful memories? So let's take a look at that. Uh, and maybe this changes based on the type of information that he's recalling. But I think what you're going to see in the next few videos is pretty interesting when it comes to eyes. Greg? Yeah, so let's talk about eye movement just for a minute. What you're going to find in him is this is a great study in eye movement. He doesn't have a single place his eyes go for information. And this guy asks some great questions. And what happens is when he asks those questions, it, he locks down a visual accessing cue, and it's a beautiful one. We'll see it later. We'll also see auditory accessing cues, and then we'll see him conjecturing. It's a beautiful thing. He's about like most of the NLP stuff teaches. So it'll be an interesting one for you to watch because he gets him narrowly focused. Uh, but in the beginning, he purses his lips, and you see that, and you're thinking, what's going on with that exactly? At coincidence, when he says coincidences, his blink rate goes through the roof. Not talking about flutter or processor speed, I'm talking about blink rate because he's prepared for it. His lips get tightly held, and then he starts milling his jaw as his chin drops, as you pointed out, Scott, or uh, Chase. Then he does riveted eye contact, what Scott and I have called in, in the True Crime Workshop, the romancer. He makes riveted eye contact. He does that one shoulder shrug and breaks eye contact away from the camera, and then back to it. If you watch him, he's turtling. He's shrinking the target or turtling, making his body smaller and minimizing. When he says, if in fact, I love this because he is reframing the question and he is taking it away from coincidence. Then he feigns confusion at how it got there. Then you do see processor speed flutters. He's trying to figure out what to say. Back to straight hard eye contact and browbeating as he shows irritation. You can't miss that jaw. 
This doesn't mean that he killed his wife. This means something. But it could mean simply he's fed up with answering the questions. It's funny, I chose that word in my very first video, and he used that word later. But he rambles and uses distancing language, I, I personally, as he distances from the actual act. This gone is the concise OJ about why he's doing this, the friendly OJ about what happened. We're in a different place. Scott, what do you got? He never says, I don't know. He never answers the question. And we see this, um, this Showtime OJ start melting away. All this, all this shininess starts going away as the questions start, and this is a great place to start because this is this is where he starts using like Chase brought up, uh, language, what we call uh, fading facts, where he talks about Rockingham. He's tr he says Rockingham. He, he almost whispers it. He's trying to uh, distance himself with the language away from everything there. This house that was that did this. I was here at Rockingham. He everything is in is just distance from him. So he's trying to to psychologically separate himself from that situation. As hit at the top we see that lip compression. So we know he's getting ready for for something. He's he, obviously when you get asked questions like this, you're gonna think about what's coming up. You've got to be on the ball. So that's one of the things we're seeing in that that lip compression where where he's he's prepping in other words. Not that he's trying to hold anything back, but he's like, okay, here we go. That's what that's about. Um when he talks about uh I, I think he accidentally says that he was over at uh, Nicole's house. So you're right, Chase, when, he, when he's talking about that. I think he lets that slip. Wouldn't happen over at her house before I get over here. I think that's that's the first part in this group of videos we're going to watch where he sort of slips up and starts telling us what happened or where he was at that time, even though he's been over it a lot. And he's been through through witness preparation, and he's been, you can tell by the way he acts and the way he talks, there are things we use, and, and we're seeing him in there. So that's that's fairly obvious. But the shine is starting to come off of it right out of the gate in that in that second question there. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, so where is the calm, assertive gentleman that we had before? Uh, he started to drift away, if not, you know, completely disappeared, even this quickly on. Breathing rate is significantly up. So look at that video. Go back and look at that baseline as well. Check out where the top of the chest is going. Count the numbers there. Notice the difference. Uh, head down and aggressive now. Eyes more locked, more targeted. So there's more aggression in there within the meat of what he's doing, not within the framework. So remember, in the baseline, he comes in quite aggressive, but then calms down. Here, he's more aggressive within the meat of the content. Um, oh, this is some nice eye stuff that I noticed there, which is the eyes are kind of micro looking at the examiner. They're trying to look at, at nose and eyes and lips and work out what is this person thinking and feeling. You can see his conscious and unconscious mind trying to track the emotions of the interviewer, the examiner. And so that's a, a, a really clear indicator that he's under stress and pressure and he wants to know what's going on here. Um, so hypervigilant at the moment. Again, he wasn't hypervigilant before in way more command of it. And I don't think so. That single shoulder shrug, that suggests to me that he's unsure whether he doesn't think so. He maybe thinks so. There, yeah, that's all I got on that one. But the coincidences still remain. Okay. I, again, you know, whether it's yours or not, mm -hmm. the contention, your blood at the crime scene, your blood, coincidence, here at Rockingham found the same night of uh, that the crime happened, well, and in the Bronco. Well, in a, if in fact that was my blood here at the home, mm -hmm. if in fact it was, I don't find that to be well, such was a it? coincidence. Was it? I don't think so, but I don't find How that did to it be get a coincidence. Here, How did it get here? How, whose blood was it here at Rockingham? If in fact it was mine, if in fact it was mine, I live here at Rockingham. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you're going to be surprised at how little blood is involved in this this bloody home that I hear. It's three no, there were, there of were blood, drops of blood. Drops of blood on the driveway. Yeah. If, in fact, it happened, if, in fact, I deposited it, it would have not been, certainly not after leaving Nicole's house because I hadn't been in Nicole's house. And maybe when I was running around, I really had absolutely no answer for that. Mm -hmm. I, I personally, I am very skeptical about whose blood that was. All right. What about the victim's blood in your Bronco? Once again, it's the, we go back to the same thing. Uh, 
I hear about blood being in my Bronco. I'm told that there should have been a lot more blood in the Bronco if this was a victim's blood. I, it amazes me that that experienced criminalist could look in this car, in this Bronco, looking for blood. This is the trial of the century, the case of all time. I mean, you heard the detectives talk about that from day one, and for two months they can't find blood. Uh, people got in that car looking for blood on this um, um, dashboard and on the, uh, the divider, I guess. I can't recall what they call that. Yeah. Console. Console. And uh, they don't find blood. And months <clears throat> later, they find it. They put it all together, and they say it's the victim's blood. I find it curious that there was a four allele drop of blood on the steering wheel that didn't come to Nicole, didn't come to Ron Goldman, didn't come to O.J. Simpson. I would submit that if they would have typed that blood, dropped or smudged that they saw on the door handle of the Bronco, mm -hmm. it probably would have been a four allele. Uh, uh, but they didn't. I don't understand how I definitely went to my Bronco right before I left. I opened the door of my Bronco. I went in the Bronco. Allen Park, Cato were here at that time. Why wasn't my finger, uh, fingerprints on the handle of my Bronco? I submit somebody opened that Bronco, didn't want their fingerprints on it, erased it. I submit that there's no way that Mark Furman could have seen the blood spots that he claimed to have seen on the running board and stuff of that car unless the door was open. And I think that was proven. I don't think anybody disputes that you could not see those blood spots that he claimed to have seen unless he was in the Bronco. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I'll just read it out. Uh, your Bronco. Okay, that's the interviewer says your Bronco. Then he does go to my Bronco, but then it becomes the Bronco. It becomes this car. It becomes that car. Then it becomes this dashboard. So it's kind of come back. But this is all when he is um, when he's talking about evidence for blood in, you know, his Bronco. It becomes a totally different vehicle not not attached to him until he says why weren't my fingerprints on my bronco so once he's able to go look i i, I submit your honor so he becomes a lawyer at this point he uses lawyer talk i submit uh that if uh my fingerprints aren't on it then it's my bronco if there's anything to do with me around that car then it's that car it's that dashboard it doesn't belong to me so beautiful dislocation and softening around that uh, that evidence there uh chase what do you got on this one well uh you stole my uh bronco idea <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm Good really job, glad I that, first because i don't glad I'd we have agree nothing else <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad we agree and <laughs> Right off the bat, we're hearing these auditory words. I hear and I'm told and we're hearing auditory words. So let's pay attention if the sensory words of this person change during this. So maybe there, maybe during a certain point in the future, in the next few videos, you're going to hear him shift very strongly to visual words. And maybe it's a different circumstance. But if you're ever an interviewer and you hear something like this, this is a clue of what words that you should start using. But this is the first time we hear him say the word victim instead of Nicole. And I think this is likely just because he's recalling the statement that he's referring to. And I think uh, when he's saying, uh, I think it's experienced criminalists, there's some glabella movement here, which suggests some disapproval, some anger. And this whole delivery is consistent with the exception of his small increase in blink rate during the piece here about the blood on the handle of the Bronco. And even that only scores a six on the behavioral table of elements. So if this is deceptive, it's damn good. And we're, I'm going to tell you probably why this is so good uh, in just a minute. Greg. Yeah. Well, let's start right off with that. There's my note. Plausible irritation. That's what this is. If I were in a position where I believed that someone had done something to me, I'd be irritated. We always say that if a person doesn't go, I didn't do it, and what the hell's your problem? If they don't do that, we're suspicious. That's what he's doing right here. So this is a good, whether it's prepared or not, this is beautiful. This is done perfectly. The indicators that it may be prepared are that his hands are locked. 
Now he's a hand talker. So when you notice that when he illustrates with his hands and they're not happening, he has his hands locked down. <clears throat> when they ask him for conjecture, now we're going to hit eye movement. This is where you start to lock him down. They ask him for a question that requires conjecture. Watch his eyes drift off to his right, to his right, over to white like nine or 10 o'clock, somewhere in there. If you then pay attention and he's trying to think of a word, which is auditory recall or using language, watch his eyes go back to this digital place between his brow ridge and his cheekbone to his left as he's trying to rec recall the word for console. He's digging for words. That's memory all day. So we're getting a good base on him where he goes for information. Then he goes to internal voice as he's talking and raises his brow. Doesn't mean he's lying. He's saying, do you follow what I'm saying? His blink rate goes through the roof and that's fight or flight. When we see that, that doesn't mean guilt. It can also mean pissed off because I'm innocent and. So you can't read into any of this. We're just gonna point it all out to you and let you make decisions as we get all the way back to that first video. But in here, his head and his illustrators and his face are all congruent and all make the same message. Lots of illustrators and his request for approval is timed at the right thing or do you get me? Finally, his chin drives that information that he feels like this blood was planted. So this is, to me, plausible irritation. Scott, what do you got? This is one, one time where I wish we'd gotten Peter Hyatt and said, hey man, will you give us a quick breakdown? Just do a quick little video on this play, what you think about this, because the words in this are, it's so incredible. He says, uh, within 75 seconds, he says blood 12 times, Bronco 10 times, I, me, or my 20 times. And it's all pointing back to him. That's the, that's the thing. It's all, all the words are about him and blood and the Bronco, but he's saying those words so much. It's, it's, I'd love to see what, what Peter had to say about that. Cause I'm sure he could nail whatever that, whatever that whole thing was for. You guys pretty much got everything I was going to talk about. What about the victim's blood in your Bronco? Once again, it's the, we go back to the same thing. Uh, I hear about blood being in my Bronco. I'm told that there should have been a lot more blood in the Bronco if this was a victim's blood. I, it amazes me that that experienced criminalist could look in this car, in this Bronco, looking for blood. This is the trial of the century, the case of all time. I mean, you heard the detectives talk about that from day one, and for two months they can't find blood. Uh, people got in that car looking for blood on this um, um, dashboard and on the, uh, the divider, I guess. I can't recall what they call that. Yeah. Console. Console. And uh, they don't find blood. And months mm -hmm. later, they find it. They put it all together, and they say it's the victim's blood. I find it curious that there was a four allele drop of blood on the steering wheel that didn't come to Nicole, didn't come to Ron Goldman, didn't come to O.J. Simpson. I would submit that if they would have typed that blood, dropped or smudged that they saw on the door handle of the Bronco, mm -hmm. it probably would have been a four allele, uh, uh, but they didn't. I don't understand how I definitely went to my Bronco right before I left. I opened the door of my Bronco. I went in the Bronco. Allen Park, Cato were here at that time. Why wasn't my finger, uh, fingerprints on the handle of my Bronco? I submit somebody opened that Bronco, didn't want their fingerprints on it, erased it. I submit that there's no way that Mark Furman could have seen the blood spots that he claimed to have seen on the running board and stuff of that car unless the door was open. And I think that was proven. I don't think anybody disputes that you could not see those blood spots that he claimed to have seen unless he was in the Bronco. Let's move on. Size 12 Bruno Molly shoe prints found mm -hmm. at the crime scene. What size shoes do you wear? OJ, well, coincidence? Well, if you go into my closet, you'll see from 10 and a half to 13s, uh, they focused on 12s. It's coincidence. You know? I understand. Well, it's a coincidence. Well, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Let me ask the public this. The FBI did an exhaustive search about Bruno Magley shoes. Mm -hmm. They said it was a rare shoe. They went to every outlet that sold Bruno Magley shoes. Not one person said they ever sold me right. these Bruno Magley shoes. Now, they said this is a very... Uh, the, the, the most exhaustive investigation of all time, yeah. right? No, I was the most exhaustively uh, investigated person of all time. The case wasn't. Who bought Bruno Magli shoes? Did, did the FBI tell us who in L.A. might have purchased Bruno Magli shoes? Mm -hmm. uh, if they did, we don't know about did that. Did you ever have any? First of all, I would have never worn those ugly shoes, <laughs> you know. Oh, I can't okay. tell you. I can't tell you the name of the shoes I have on now. I, I think with most men... Mm -hmm. Uh, unless they're tennis shoes, you know, uh, Nike, uh, you know, some make of uh, 
uh, tennis shoe, you know the name of your tennis shoe. I can't tell you the name of any, and I may have upwards of 40 pairs of shoes uh, upstairs, shoes upstairs. Um, I couldn't tell you the name of the shoe. So you I've don't never, know if you've I've, ever owned a pair of yeah, those shoes? Yeah, I don't know. I've never walked into a shoe store and asked uh, for a named pair of shoes ever in my life. All right, I'll go first on this one. Um, I don't think anybody has shoe sizes from 10 and a half to 13 in their closet, unless there's other people living there and using your closet too. So that's right. But I don't think there was anybody else living there. That's crazy talk. How could you look somebody in the face and say, oh man, I've got shoes size from, from 10 and a half to 13. In my closet, I have shoes that are size 10 and a half. That's it. Because that's the size I wear. Whether it's dress shoes, whether it's whatever I'm wearing, that's what they are. They're 10 and a halfs. Um, he knows it's not pronounced Bruno Magley. It's not pronounced that way. And in the circles he ran in, somebody would have said, dude, don't, don't, don't say Magley. It's, it's, it's Bruno Molly. So somebody would have hipped him to that. Somebody would have said, hey, man, that, don't, don't be saying that. And they'd have been making fun of him. You know, OJ, what, what, tell me about those shoes. What are those? Who makes those? Bruno Magley? <laughs> Check that. So somebody would have corrected him on that. He knows better than that. Um, that, that we're seeing perception management all over the place here, including that word Magley when he says that, because he wants you to think he's he, he's so far removed from having any of those. He's not even pronouncing it right. That's why he's saying it wrong so many times, in my opinion. Um, what else have I got here? Oh, too much, too many details to going way too into the details without answering the question. Again, this is the second time he's been asked a question that he just totally does not go in for the answer. No, I don't. No, I didn't. No, never says that. Never says that at all. Chase, what do you got? All right. <laughs> <laughs> We've got more that, issue here with uh, discomfort with inaccuracy. And di we, we talk about this a lot on, on our channel. So the person's not comfortable with something being inaccurate or not knowing it doesn't need any more than I'm not sure, or I don't know if that's the answer, then that discomfort is something you should see on people. So right when he says, do you have any, there is a non answer. There is a spike in humor that deviates from baseline where he's talking about how ugly the shoes are. There's a TDS, which is when your eyes move all over the place a transderivational search to a known question. So TDS is great when you're trying to recall information, but if I ask you something that you know, because you've just had spent a year in trial with it, that should not require a TDS. There's redirection right away where he says, first of all, and they're socializing the situation. So this is a result of training, which I'm going to talk about, I think in the, in the next video, I'm going to really break this down. Uh, when he's saying most men and he makes it about that. And then when he finally says, I don't know, it's casual, it's unrushed, it's dismissive, and I think it's also very rehearsed. It's polished. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, so let's take the first one. He says, I would never wear those ugly shoes. Let me tell you, I live on a farm. I got some shoes I don't like a lot. Guess which work they get. I walk in the manure and all that kind of stuff with them because I don't care if I ruin them. If I were probably going to worry about getting them ruined, I'd probably pick that pair, those ugly shoes. Just number one. That's a fact point. Uh, number two, let's just walk through here. He does my, my favorite thing. We have it on T-shirts and mugs, chaff and redirect, and in a beautiful way. He just starts to spew information that has no value at all until he gets to redirect. And once he gets to that redirect, then he starts to preach that pattern. He's all out of, all, all together away from the question. I would have leaned over and said, just answer the question because he, he avoids it like all hell. And then when he says, "At did you ever own any? I think more than socializing, he's trying to humanize himself by saying those are ugly shoes and, and, and. He breaks eye contact to conjecture. This is when it looks like a trans der derivational. In this case, Chase, I think it's more, pro more pro profound than that. He breaks over to conjecture again that we saw earlier, and then he goes back. And the first time we see a visual eye accessing cue is a hard-coded one. I got 40 pairs of shoes. 
He's thinking about all those shoes. You can't miss it. So he's giving away now some eye movement. And we're getting a good baseline on how his eyes work. I think that's a powerful one. There's no defense at all to this. He's just, I have written down in my notes, he's running like the Hertz commercial, just running through the airport, knocking stuff out of the way, not paying a bit of attention, just moving on. And then finally, he gets to that last visual. He does a redirect to get away from it one more time. And his face does something totally out of baseline at the very end. Go back and watch it again. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Scott, that not even if some of his shoes are in European sizes, would you have you know, <laughs> 10 to 13. So so there's something up there. Um, so there's something, you know, he's working against physicality in that, and that doesn't ring quite true to us. Then he tries to work against society in a bit of a, a, a too heavily protested way with this idea of uh, Marley or Magley. If he didn't really care about the brand and he hadn't, re he wouldn't care. He'd just follow the pronunciation of whoever pronounced it first. It would be, make no difference to him. But clearly it does make a difference to him. Either that he thinks it's pronounced Magley, which you're right, Scott. People would have said, you're getting it wrong, mate. Uh, you got to look cool. It's actually Marley. So, so. Look, th this is out of so a social characteristic here. And you might go, yeah, but I mean, you know, he's a social outsider. He's, he's you know, there's only one OJ. No, there's only one Bruno Marley as well. And, and what brands do is they, they literally get a hot iron on the skin of people and they embed a, a symbol into them, a, 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 a motif and a word that people cannot get out of their out of their skin out of their mind and and so you're trying to suggest well here's a guy who doesn't care ab about shoe brands no you, you're in a period of time where somebody like him and the world in general absolutely cared and still care about those things because the businesses have put billions and billions of dollars into making us care about this. He is not so much of an outsider that he wouldn't care about this. Um, so look, uh, did you have any? Doesn't answer the question. And he creates circumstances as to why, you know, he, he, he wouldn't care about it. And then to your point, Chase, which you'll go on about later on, he socializes the idea of most men wouldn't know what brand of shoe they're on. So that suggests to me, if I come back at him, him and go, yeah, but OJ, like, I totally know the brand of shoe that I've got on right now. And I know every brand of shoe that he's able to go, well, Mark, that's because you're not a man. You're not a real man. So he's put me in a corner that says, I can't come back. If I'm a real man, I can't question that. That's a super clever maneuver. That's a great social maneuver. That means I'm at risk of my, my, my maleness is at risk by even questioning that. Size 12 Bruno Mali shoe prints found mm -hmm. at the crime scene. What size shoes do you wear? OJ, well, coincidence? Going, well, if you go into my closet, you'll see from 10 and a half to 13s. Uh, they focused on 12s. It's coincidence, you know? I understand. Well, it's a coincidence, but let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Let me ask the public this. The FBI did an exhaustive search about Bruno Magli shoes. Mm -hmm. They said it was a rare shoe. They went to every outlet that sold Bruno Magli shoes. Not one person said they ever sold me these right. Bruno Magli shoes. Now, they say this is a very, uh, the, the, the most exhaustive investigation of all time, yeah. right? No, I was the most exhaustively uh, investigated person of all time. The case wasn't. Who bought Bruno Magli shoes? Did, did the FBI tell us who in L.A. might have purchased Bruno Magli shoes? Mm -hmm. uh, if they did, we don't know about did that. Did you ever have any? First of all, I would have never worn those ugly shoes, <laughs> you know. Oh, I can't okay. tell you. I can't tell you the name of the shoes I have on now. I, I think with most men, mm -hmm. uh, unless they're tennis shoes, you know, uh, Nike, uh, you know, some make of a, a tennis shoe, you know the name of your tennis shoe. I can't tell you the name of any. I may have upwards of forty pairs of shoes uh, upstairs. Shoes upstairs. Um, I can tell you the name of the shoe. So you I've don't never, know if you ever owned a pair of yeah, those. Yeah, I don't know. I've never walked into a shoe store and asked. Uh, for a named pair of shoes ever in my life. All right. Cool.
Do you still have the two pairs of gloves that Nicole bought for you? I don't know if Nicole ever bought me gloves. I never recall Nicole ever buying me gloves. Now, we do have, and the prosecution knows this, we do have a uh, uh, discovery from friends of ours, mm -hmm. uh, at least one, uh, that said Nicole bought him two pair of shoes, I mean two pair of gloves, gloves, not these pair of gloves. At Christmas, I buy for possibly, I know, over, well over a hundred people. Mm -hmm. Nicole normally was in charge of getting Christmas presents for various people. I would buy for my son, for AC, for Marcus Allen, uh, you know, a few of my very close friends I would buy for. But then we had this other group of friends and Nicole would get the list and she'd go out and buy for them. I don't know if she bought these gloves for someone. I do know that one person did come forward and also sent the gloves that she had purchased uh, uh, for him. And I'm not sure of this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that was from But you had them on in the photograph? No, no, no. At I the sidelines? I had on gloves that looked similar to them. They may have been that make. I don't know. But if you look at pictures of me on sidelines, mm -hmm. you've seen me wear numerous gloves, numerous colored gloves. Where are any of those gloves? In those pictures, I asked you, where are any of the clothes that I wore in those uh, But the coincidence, I'm talking about public perception and coincidence. Yeah. And isn't it a coincidence that you stand in a photograph with similar gloves on to the gloves that were apparently worn by the murderer? I don't know. It's a coincidence, isn't you, it? You can say it's a coincidence, but I, I submit that any well-dressed man uh, who wears gloves, everybody in the East wears gloves. And mm -hmm. I, you can walk down the street and I can guarantee you Time and time again, you'll see similar make gloves. I find it, is it a coincidence that there was no gloves upstairs? Is it a coincidence that I had a, a one glove that looked like these gloves? As a matter of fact, I would submit to you, if I put on the one glove they found upstairs that had lambskin interior, and I stood across this room while you took a picture, it'd be pretty difficult to tell that glove from the gloves that they said I was wearing in the, in the, in the, uh, you know, the photographs in the photograph. and trials. I also say, what happened to the other glove of that? All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm just going to jump to the to the long term piece. But first of all, he he's let's just jump to the end. This is why they didn't want him talking, because he talks himself right off the end of a pier here when he says, is it a coincidence that I have a glove exactly like the one found at the crime scene? That will. Yeah. OK, now you, you you know why his attorney said, let's not let this guy get in front of folks. But he starts off chaffing and redirecting. Simple question. What happened to those gloves? He could have said, well, in fact, she never bought me any. End of question. But he doesn't. He starts talking. He chaffs, redirects, and he touches his face. The only time in this entire interview that he touches his face, I believe, is here. You guys correct me if I'm wrong. His cadence is altered as he tries to talk his way out of this. You can hear him slow down. Where are any of those gloves? When they say coincidence, this word is, is, a, is a hot button for him because when they say coincidence, his eyes narrow, his lips purse, and his chin goes forward in anger. Could again be that he's fed up and there's a fading fact in there at, at yes. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, so it just struck me. Um, <laughs> here's, here's OJ's uh, um, uh, criteria for how you know if you're a man, uh, a real man. <laughs> You wear gloves and and you have no idea what brand of shoes you're wearing. Just so everybody knows, if you want to be a real man out there, that's how you do it, according to OJ. Um, so the main thing for me is, is the question was, um, did she buy you those gloves? And the answer would be, she did not buy me those gloves. I mean, that would be that would be the answer. But he doesn't give that answer. He deflects to other gloves being bought. Uh, not these gloves. He hides it all around the abundance of gifts that get bought and throws other people's names in. He, his mind is running 10 to the dozen here in a way that now can't control his mouth. And I think saliva is now coming out because I think we get a chin wipe there, which is about just his mouth isn't functioning in the way that it should. And again, go back to that baseline and how clear and careful he is with his words. And now he's a runaway train and he's got spit coming out all over the place. So it's, it's, if nothing else, it is way out of his usual baseline here. Scott, what do you got on this one? He goes from when he asks him about the gloves, he goes all the way from, I, I buy Christmas presents for over 100 people. And he goes from not saying no, to, it's just, it's mind boggling. I'm trying to get my head around a way to, 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 
pose this or, or, or say it, but it's so bizarre how far out of his way he goes to not say he doesn't know or not to answer the question. He talks about buying 100 people Christmas presents, which has nothing whatsoever to do with that question. That alone, he's getting good at this, too. He's been hanging around lawyers too much because every answer is all just chaff and redirect. He's not answering the questions at all. And it just seems to be flowing right by this guy at some parts. He does try to come back to him sometimes, but he never nails him down and says, hey, man, hang on. Answer the question. You didn't answer that question. He doesn't pin him on that. And there's lots of places you can pin him good on that. Um, that's that's I'm going to I'll rest there. Chase, what do you got? I think it's uh, interesting that he and the lawyer are now we. So this is the first time he's using this team collective pronoun to talk about himself and uh, the attorneys. And especially after having such a negative slant on that stuff at the beginning. But I think this is overall adapted behavior that we're seeing that was probably learned in a courtroom and very much shaped by understanding jury psychology. So somebody like us. So like the briefings and training that go into a high end case like this would probably blow your mind. It is next level stuff that people it's hard to even conceptualize how much work would go into this. This trial part prep starts in, in many cases, months before the event. There are prescription medications to regulate behavior like blood pressure and skin flushing and facial flushing. There's hundreds of interviews, probably hundreds of hours of different interviews with trial consultants or people that are like us. And it's not cheap. There's video analysis where they replay this guy's video and show him all of his tells and they make you watch your tells over and over until you kind of weed them out. And they're doing this for dozens of hours, probably with different people. And they're hiring people like us to come in and just dissect every movement and then retrain behaviors to be perfect. And I'm telling you, this is probably millions of dollars in, in people like us that were involved in preparing this. And that's our job is to change that behavior. So I think that's really what we're seeing here. It looks so good because they've invested a lot in this behavior. This behavior that we're seeing on camera is an investment. Do you still have the two pairs of gloves that Nicole bought for you? I don't know if Nicole ever bought me gloves. I never recall Nicole ever buying me gloves. Now we do have, and the prosecution knows this, we do have a uh, uh, discovery from friends of ours, mm -hmm. uh, at least one, uh, that said Nicole bought him two pair of shoes, I mean two pair of gloves, gloves, not these pair of gloves. At Christmas, I buy for possibly, I know, over well over a hundred people. Mm -hmm. Nicole normally was in charge of getting Christmas presents for various people. I would buy for my son, for AC, for Marcus Allen, uh, you know, a few of my very close friends I would buy for. But then we had this other group of friends, and Nicole would get the list, and she'd go out and buy for them. I don't know if she bought these gloves for someone. I do know that one person did come forward and also sent the gloves that she had purchased uh, uh, for him. And I'm not sure of this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that was from But you had them on in the photograph. No, no, no. At I the sidelines? I had on gloves that looked similar to them. They may have been that make. I don't know. But if you look at pictures of me on sidelines, mm -hmm. you've seen me wear numerous gloves, numerous colored gloves. Where are any of those gloves? In those pictures, I asked you, where are any of the clothes that I wore in those uh, But the coincidence, I'm talking about public perception and coincidence. Yeah. And isn't it a coincidence that you stand in a photograph with similar gloves on to the gloves that were apparently worn by the murderer? I don't know. It's a coincidence, isn't you, it? You can say it's a coincidence, but I, I submit that any well-dressed man uh, who wears gloves, everybody in the East wears gloves. And mm -hmm. I, you can walk down the street and I can guarantee you time and time again, you'll see similar make gloves. Mm -hmm. I find it, is it a coincidence that there was no gloves upstairs? Is it a coincidence that I had a, a one glove that looked like these gloves? As a matter of fact, I would submit to you if I put on the one glove they found upstairs that had lambskin interior, and I stood across this room while you took a picture, it'd be pretty difficult to tell that glove from the gloves that they said I was wearing in the, in the, in the, uh, in, you know, the photographs in the photograph. and trials. I also say, what happened to the other glove of that? Who was the person that Alan Park saw walking across your driveway just, uh, was it four minutes before 11? Who see, was that person? See, 
Once again, <clears throat> we, we go to Marsha Clark, and I think if I hope we have enough time and you ask well, enough questions, I'll try to shorten my answers up yeah. so that we can. I want to hit but, these, these points of, that people have questions about. It was people, never answered. It's never been revealed no, who, what people, who that is. The, the problem is Marsha Clark. Marsha Clark has given an impression of things, and people are living with those impressions. I'm seeing the pundits on TV commenting on things that were not facts in this case. There was any, never, Alan Parton never once said that he saw anybody walking across a driveway. During questioning, he certainly indicated that no, he may he have saw seen... someone right outside the front door of my okay. house. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think there's a reason why OJ is such a huge star is he's quite phenomenal. I mean, he has managed to pick up how to structure an argument just like a lawyer does. And, and I think you're right, Chase, there's, there's potentially millions of dollars of education in this, but you can... You can supply the information to people, but whether they can pick it up and then use it under pressure, that's a whole different thing. And I think he's pretty amazing in this situation. By the way, the interviewer is off their baseline. They're scratching their, their cheek here, which suggests to me, because it's out of baseline, the interviewer thinks they got something good here. They think they've got something good. And they're already signaling this to the to the to the subject. Um, who was the person? Who was that person? So that's the issue here is is the person. So um, OJ deflects by invoking time. That's a really smart move because now we've got to go. No, no, we got all the time in the world. That's not the case. He's brought time pressure in there. He's reframed the problem. The problem here is is Clark. I don't know quite who Clark is, but the problem is Clark reframes the issue here, and then he starts to frame the inaccuracy around that. He then sustained, then the, the interviewer comes in to try and play against that inaccuracy. He sustains the inaccuracy and now he's got the interviewer completely cornered because it's true, the interviewer has now been inaccurate. OJ here wins a point. If this were a trial, you would go, good point, well made, stand down, that, that was beautifully done. And, and I would suggest he's got this set up right from the start. He does take a certain brain, a certain intellect to be able to play out that little game of chess there. So uh, really, really interesting. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? I think that little game of chess is the only game he's got. We're seeing the only game he plays, which is chaff and redirect, and he blames everything or, or, or pushes everything to someone else. His big concern here, we're going to see this later on in the, in the second group of videos, is who that second person was with him. Now, I'm going to tell you what what I think, and it's just my opinion. And it doesn't mean, you know, there's no reason, I, I'm not going to say what I, but there was somebody else there, but I think I know who it was. I think you guys got a pretty good idea as well. So later on, I'll tell you who I think it it might be i'm not sure who i'm not sure and i can't say this guy did it but i'm pretty sure but he's he looks at that person as a as a very dangerous subject to be around so he dances around that and he watches what he says around that around that person so in this case there was no other person that had anything to do with this there isn't anybody so let's keep that in mind as we go through this um we're seeing the body language of frustration and anger here. He's getting frustrated. And we're seeing that in his glabella. We're seeing that in his, how, his, how his movements are becoming a little bit more exaggerated. His illustrators are strong, and they're landing in the right place, just like that. An illustrator, people keep asking us what these phrases and terms we all use are. Illustrators are the way the brain emphasizes specific words and phrases like I did just then. And when you see those, if they don't land on the right words or where they're supposed to, or if there are extra ones like that, something's up. It means that it, it suggests they're insecure with their answer, they're not sure about their answer, or they're, they're not confident with it. So keep that in mind as we go through here as well. He's got his head up, and at the same time, it's tilted forward. That's another thing that gives us a heads up. He's really, he's really uh, frustrated with this, with this question, and, he, and he's angry about it because this gets in on his territory that he wants nobody to know anything about. This is sacred ground for him here, so he's got to hold that ground. Um, but again, another classic OJ chaff and redirect. Speaking of chaff and redirect, Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, it's even more than that. This is the most prepared thing he's going to do. I think you hit it dead on, Mark. He is really well prepared for this. And I have written down on here, for those of my age, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. That's all I see if you know the Brady Bunch. So it's, that's exactly what it made me think when I saw it, is he's bringing her up because he's pushing it, is chaffing and redirecting, moving all the blame off him and moving it back to her. He's snarky in this one. You can see that kind of exaggerated facial movement and the wooden body language that I I'm with you, Scott. I've got it written right on my notes. Snarky and frustrated. His messaging is congruent because he's angry, he's upset, and he's pushing a point. And then he goes into browbeating and points his his head down as he's starting to tell him exactly how things are. When you look through under the bottom of your over your glasses and under your brow, that's browbeating. And then the final one here that I found really interesting is I'm with you, Mark. The guy thinks he's got something because he does this. He uses a regulator to say, "Come on, give it to me," and then he doesn't get what he thought. Chase, what do you got? So there's some uh, contempt right away about these public assumptions that uh, might not be in the case. And the question never really gets answered at all. He's redirecting to poking holes instead of providing information, and which is exactly what you guys are saying. And, and it's brilliantly done. And when he goes to correct the information from the interviewer, you see this chin raise go up, a little neck exposure, which we do as a challenge, which all primates do as a challenge. We expose a vital organ when we want to challenge somebody. And we see the eyes widen and an eyebrow flash. So we see a whole lot of behaviors right there when he starts doing this to make sure that he holds ground. And this interviewer is an expert interrupter. So he wants to make sure he leans forward and has that facial expression to hold his ground so he can get that one point across. Then there's, I think this correction is just a dominant behavior. And look for a lack of this behavior in questions that are far more significant. So look for a, when he's correcting something, a detail that's far more significant, we should see a similar behavior. So this might give you a clue to something that is coming up. Who was the person that Alan Park saw walking across your driveway just, uh, was it four minutes before 11? Who see, was that person? See, once again, <clears throat> we, we go to Marshall Clark and I think if, I hope we have enough time and you ask well, enough questions, I'll try to shorten my answers up yeah. so that we can. I wanna hit but, these, these points of, that people have questions about. It was people, never answered, it's never been revealed no, who, what people, who that is. The, the problem is Marsha Clark. Marsha Clark has given an impression of things, and people are living with those impressions. I'm seeing the pundits on TV commenting on things that were not facts. In this case, there was any, never, Alan Park never once said that he saw anybody walking across a driveway. During questioning, he certainly indicated that no, he may he have saw seen. someone right outside the front door of my okay. house. Let's talk about the day of June 12th, 1994. Yeah. Tell me about getting ready for your daughter's recital. Just tell me, take me through the day. It was a long week. I had been to three or four cities that week. I was totally exhausted. My friends in New York tried to get me to stay in New York uh, uh, that Friday, play golf Saturday, and then go straight to Chicago where I had to be Monday morning. But my daughter was having a recital and I had already missed, I think the, the week or two before, I, had, I was out of town and I had missed I had missed something, I forget what it was, uh, something that my daughter was having. So I couldn't miss this. So I said, I gotta be there for the recital. And I flew into town and I just wanted to go there, see my daughter and leave. And I talked to Nicole briefly that day. She had called and asked if I could get, if I could get there early and hold seats. And I said, I don't think so, which she did. And when we got to the recital, uh, she had actually held me a seat with her and the two kids, right? There was something and uh, that you write in the book about what Nicole was wearing. That... Yeah, you know, we, it was like, it was like, it almost like she was trying to be a teenager again. You know, dating all these much younger guys, uh, wearing the shortest, tightest thing she was wearing. And sometimes you think something is inappropriate, but you don't say anything. What am I, what am I to say? Tell her what to do, you know? All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so let's take this as a, as a, as a slight baseline as well. So, uh, tight-lipped at the start, and he opens with with a real kind of Wallace and Gromit, Nick Park 
fear expression right off the top. Very quick, but I think I see fear there. So tight-lipped and fear. So the frame for all of this for me is something is about to come up which he is fearful of and he maybe thinks he shouldn't really say. Um, this idea of he missed something, but he's searching. He's searching for what it is. It's like, I think you're adding detail here that you hadn't worked out beforehand shouldn't like if if you if that was important detail you'd have gone to your daughter and you'd have said hey what was it that i'd missed those weeks before help me fill in the blanks he hasn't filled in the blanks so again he's off his game here because he's making stuff up as he goes along uh, he puts in this idea of of exhausting uh, so again, he's trying to create an idea of mitigating circumstances, I think, for all that comes up. Again, now we've got this idea, I think, that if you are a, if you're a man, if you're a real man, you are exhausted because you work really hard. So there's mitigating circumstances for the things you do because you work hard, you're exhausted, you don't know what brand of shoes you've got on and you're always wearing gloves. Now, even the baseline, therefore, I don't really like the frame around it the frame around his baseline is one of something massive is coming up and he's already preparing the framework by which we we view it but within it what i would say is we see a lot of illustrators and we see them symmetrical as well so he really when he really gets going into what is potentially some factual elements around this that the, the recital who was there um we see a lot of symmetry and we see a lot of description with his hands uh greg what do you got on this one yeah mark i love the fact you picked up on him searching now, this is 10 years later. This is 2006. His handlers are gone. He's got no money. There's no one around to help him out. We're going to see a difference. In his baseline here, he makes a huge mistake, a big gamble for a guy like me sitting across from him. And that is he searches for information in his visual access and cues. So when you ask him what he missed, first of all, I would have said eh, nothing. I wouldn't have given you something to come back and ask what was it you missed. And I certainly would not volunteer that information. And when we coach witnesses, when we're talking to people about deposition, we're gonna say that. Don't volunteer anything, and when you do it, try to keep it concise and simple so you don't have to rifle around in your head looking for information. What he does is go back up to his left, back to a visual accessing cue we saw him use when he was rifling through his closet and account's shoes. Ding, ding, ding. There's a great indicator that when he remembers something visual, he's going to go up because he's trying to remember what it was he missed and he's thinking about it. But other than that, he looks like the earlier guy. His pitch, tone, and cadence are all strong. He comes in in an emotional state. You can see his eyes are drifted down right. He sits and starts to grip that chair. And Mark, I think that's the anxiety that you're seeing. He does 50-50 eye contact, but makes eye contact and locks to make his point. That's OJ if you go watch him in the 70s and 80s. That's him. That's who he is. And his blink rate is low, so it's showing that he's getting comfortable. He stares into space when he's working on a memory. We all do that when he's thinking about something and trying to work out details. But then he shows anguish in his brow when he's trying to remember that. You can see it in here. He gets comfortable, and then he starts moving around. He uses one hand, then the other hand. He gets a little irritated when she interrupts him, if you notice his face. He gets a little irritation in his face, and then he has some disdain or disgust, or maybe a little bit of both when he's talking about it. Nicole wearing clothes that were too tight. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, totally agree with you. I'm excited because we finally get to have a discussion about digital flexion where we can see a perfect <laughs> example of it. And right at the beginning, when you're talking about him getting a little stressed on the face, we can see the hands kind of dig into the chair. So we're, we're seeing the fingers curl in at the moment of discomfort right there. And it's in plain sight, right as she says, the day, the words, the day. And I think right when he's recalling how many times he's missed a recital, there's some anguish there on the face. I think that might be just anger at himself. And there's a lot of nine o'clock I am movement. So he's going over there to, to, to our nine o'clock as you're watching this video with us, it's nine o'clock to you, but he ships to two o'clock. Like Greg, you were saying when he's thinking about Nicole's outfit and what she wore and, and visualizing the outfit that she had on. And finally, what I think is important to note here is there's some, I think concealed anger right at the moment where he's talking about who am I to tell her what to do? 
and a little bit of a challenge because there's a sclera exposure when our eyes widen up and there's some anger on the face. And you can see that right at that moment, who am I to tell her what to do? So that's what I got on that one. Mark. All right. Uh, yeah, I think I'm done. I, I went, yeah. didn't I? Yeah, I think it's me. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, it's Scott. okay. All right. I think this is a great baseline. And I think you're right. I think he's he hasn't had his handlers for a while. So he's before this, he's like, yeah, I got this. I've done this before. But when he sits down, she starts asking, asking him questions. That's when the, the, the stress starts ramping up, because this is the first question she's asking. Him. This is the way it begins. And and. As you're right, Greg, when he's up there searching around, looking for his answers, those types of things, these are all things that are going to show us everything changes after this. this is the only time we see him relax like this. He's back in the chair. He's got his hands over this way. And then we see those things start gripping up and we see the whole thing start to fall apart and he can't get a handle on it. He's not. He's trying to remember how to act, but he didn't have this answer prepared. That's why it's, it's sort of like me. It sort of shoots over here and it shoots over there and it stops and starts again. And... This lets us know that he doesn't have professional help on this, but he thought he had it together when he went into it. So, and I think it sort of falls apart on him, and, and he understands that and realizes that. Let's talk about the day of June 12th, 1994. Yeah. Tell me about getting ready for your daughter's recital. Just tell me, take me through the day. It was a long week. I had been to three or four cities that week. I was totally exhausted. My friends in New York tried to get me to stay in New York, uh, uh, that Friday, play golf Saturday, and then go straight to Chicago where I had to be Monday morning. But my daughter was having a recital, and I had already missed, I think the, the week or two before, I, had, I was out of town and I had missed, I had missed something, I forget what it was, uh, something that my daughter was having. So I couldn't miss this. So I said, I gotta be there for the recital. And I flew into town, and I just wanted to go there, see my daughter, and leave. And I talked to Nicole briefly that day. She had called and asked if I could get if I could get there early and hold seats. And I said, I don't think so, which she did. And when we got to the recital, uh, she had actually held me a seat with her and the two kids, right? There was something uh, that you write in the book about what Nicole was wearing. That... Yeah, you know, we, it was like, it was like, it almost like she was trying to be a teenager again. You know, dating all these much younger guys, uh, wearing the shortest, tightest thing she was wearing. And sometimes you think something is inappropriate, but you don't say anything. What am I, what am I to say? Tell her what to do, you know? All right. We good? Yeah. All right. The chapter, chapter six, is called The Night in Question. Mm -hmm. uh, and you write in the book, now picture this and keep in mind that this is Purely hypothetical. 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 Yes. Why don't you tell me what might have happened on the night of June 12th, 1994? <laughs> And let's just walk yeah. through the night. I, well, first of all, it's, this is very difficult for me to do this. Uh, it was very difficult for me because it's hypothetical. I know and I accept the fact that people are going to feel whatever way they're going to feel. <laughs> you know, uh, they're going to, uh, um, you know, some uh, whatever, uh, whatever they want to feel. In the book, the hypothetical is... Uh, uh, Charlie uh, pulls out. Charlie. <laughs> Uh, this guy, Charlie, shows up, the guy who I had recently become friends with, and uh, I don't know why you had been by Nicole's house, but it told me you wouldn't believe what's going on over there. And, uh, and I remember thinking, well, whatever's going on over there has got to stop, right? So we kind of hooked up together, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of broad stroking this. We go over get into Bronco and go over it. Let's just go back and do the details. Where did you I'm park? i the detail. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so we start off, he immediately barriers, immediately. And then he does something I call a deflection smile. It's a nervous laughter and a smile. I have a good friend who does it. Anytime he's in, in, a, in a bind, he goes, <laughs> that kind of thing. And there, it's a way to get away from something and a way to get away from what you feel. Then he goes, he uses an, a request for approval as he raises his forehead when he's talking about how someone felt. Then a lip, lip compression at they're going to go to the house. Interestingly, if you pay attention to this guy, there's a lot of animation and what we would call residual emotion from that event that night. If there were not, if he was making this up, yeah, Mark, I think he's probably an okay actor in whatever he was doing, but he'd be a pretty damn good actor if he could bring up this much emotion talking about something that happened. 
Um, but he goes back to the recall side when he said, his friend said, you're not going to believe what's going over there. And he's emphatic with that. When he does that emphatic behavior, you see all that body language come up, see his face looking angry, and then the, it's got to stop. That's not something you would say if you're recalling a story that you didn't live. So this starts to sound real. And if he intended it to sound real good for him, he also then does a and tightens his lips. You call that a verbal tick, I think, Mark. And then he goes to eye, downright eye accessing. So let's talk for just a minute about, we talk all the time about emotional accessing. It doesn't matter what you've stored in your head. Remember, I tell you, single sensory channel matters. I can ask you all the questions there are about this coffee cup today, but if I'm punching you in the face when you're looking at the coffee cup, later, guess what you're gonna remember? You might remember the coffee cup, but you'll remember me punching you in the face because it was an emotional thing. So these emotions code things differently. So when a person's recalling something that's very emotional, you watch, he shrinks, his body gets kind of turtled, but you'll watch as he goes more into this story his head's going to become heavier and heavier and heavier, and it affects body language. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, everything changes here. That was a great baseline at the top for what we're getting ready uh, to see. He doesn't have somebody saying, as he's giving, as they're rehearsing these answers, he doesn't have somebody saying, yeah, man, that's great. That's great. Do it like that. He doesn't have that. So a lot of his confidence is gone. He, his confidence is like at a low here as we go through because it's been 10 years and he's had people point at him. He's had people yell at him. He's had people staring at him um, because of what he did. And because he got in trouble for that again, I believe, didn't he get, wasn't he found guilty of that uh, in another court? Civil suit. He had a civil suit that gave all of his property away because it, he didn't get the criminal thing. And then he had he was, another instance where he went and stole some of his former possessions. Right, but wasn't Vegas. he found responsible for the deaths in the civil suit? That, that's civil. Yeah, he was found civil. Yeah. That's where. Okay. Okay, great. So he's had people hollering that at him. So his confidence is really low on this, and you can see it. Because that's where this this really freaky, weird little laugh and smile thing comes from. He does it a couple of times in that first group, but now I think that's sort of what he, he goes back to and has done his whole life. I don't know the guy. I never met him, but I would assume that's part of his personality because he keeps going back to that, and there was nobody there to say, dude, don't do that. Don't you know? Let's stop right there. Let's try it one more time and, and get rid of that little laugh. Try not to do that. Nobody said that to him. Um, uh, oh, we see his hands. When at first, when he's talking like this, and in the in the video before this, everything's great. But then he comes up and he clasps clasps his hands, and then his left hand grabs his right hand and starts squeezing. That's an adapter. Adapters are things we use to get rid of that built up stress and tension. So the tension and stress is building here, and he's trying to get blow some of that off by doing that. This is becoming. Um, a, a tense situation for him because he's thought about it, and but he hasn't been through, I don't think, the questions that might be answered. And, I, and they obviously didn't send them to him as he goes through these. We'll, we'll be able to tell that when he was in court and he was in and, and he was there every day. And like we talked about earlier, Chase brought up as well. He went through that every day and people would, would train him every day and say, hey, here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. He's one of those guys that thinks he's got that down. But when he got in this situation where he was coming head to head with somebody, that stuff doesn't recall that quickly at all. And you forget a lot of things. And that's what's happened here. That's why he looks so nervous and things start to go downhill for him. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, I, my headline on this is WTF, where is this going? I literally, I've never seen this video before. I literally threw my pen down and had to walk around the room. It was so <laughs> astonishing. What's, this is the kind of body language, this kind of behavior that goes on when somebody's telling an alien abduction story that, that didn't quite, so there's some elements there that are accurate, but there's a whole bunch of fantasy going on. So, so I've literally got here, where is this attached to fact? Because it is attached to fact in some areas. And where is it attached to complete fantasy? This, this Charlie person, in my mind, it may as well have been a gnome called Derek who sprouts out of the ground from nowhere. Suddenly Charlie's involved. Like what? Where's Charlie come from? What the hell? Is, who's this Charlie person? Like a gnome, an alien from nowhere just sprouts into there. Um, purely, anyway, so here's, so, so here's what we can um, 
put our finger on is that purely hypothetical yes we get this slow blink of recognition so i often talk about a slow blink of recognition go and look at his blink on that that's a blink of recognition that he's saying yes that's the route we want to go down this is utterly hypothetical it's utter fantasy going on here uh and then um the the laughing and uh bitterness uh so he laughs but we get bitterness in the mouth from the interviewer so the interviewer knows something is wrong here there's a bad taste around this particular uh element anyway for me it complete though it is attached to reality in many many places there's elements here which are utter fantasy utterly made up uh chase what do you got on this one yeah i agree with you guys y'all kind of got everything anything but when he's saying i remember thinking whatever's going on it has to stop he accidentally slips into recall of an actual story in my opinion and he uses genuine memory recall i home so his eyes are moving the exactly the same and when he's saying i'm not going to say the details he uses the same eye eye movement as regular. And I think this statement alone indicates that there are details that exist about the crime that he is aware of. So there's some lip compression right at the beginning of this. And I think uh, when we see someone squeeze their lips together, that usually means that there's some with, withholding of information going on or there's some withholding of, of some sort happening. So we see that right at the beginning. And you guys talked about this barrier here and the lips are also another barrier that are, that's being formed uh, as he's preparing psychologically for the answer that he's going to give to this question. So I think what we're seeing here to me looks like genuine recall and just peppered in with some fictional elements. So Mark, like you're saying, it's fabulous alien abduction story. So maybe next one we'll have a humalian. Yeah. You want the number one indicator his attorneys are gone? No attorney said, OJ, I got a great idea. Let's go tell people if I'd killed her, here's how I would have done it. No attorney ever it. <laughs> the chapter, chapter six, is called The Night in Question. Mm -hmm. uh, and you write in the book, now picture this and keep in mind that this is Purely hypothetical. 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 Yes. Why don't you tell me what might have happened on the night of June 12th, 1994? <laughs> And let's just walk yeah. through the night. I, well, first of all, it's, this is very difficult for me to do this. Uh, it was very difficult for me because it's hypothetical. I know and I accept the fact that people are going to feel whatever way they're going to feel. <laughs> you know, uh, they're going to, uh, um, you know, some uh, whatever, uh, whatever they want to feel. In the book, the hypothetical is... Uh, uh, Charlie uh, pulls out. Charlie. <laughs> Uh, this guy, Charlie, shows up, the guy who I had recently become friends with, and uh, I don't know why you had been buying the Cole's house, but it told me you wouldn't believe what's going on over there. And, uh, and I remember thinking, well, whatever's going on over there has got to stop, right? So we kind of hooked up together, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of broad stroking this. We go over Get into Bronco and go over it. Let, let's just go back and do the details. Where did you I'm park? Like the detail. That, that, that blows publisher. my mind. Yeah. Insane. Yeah. 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 But he was hurting for money. He was hurting for money at that point. I get you know, it. Bad. I, yeah, but that I was, get it. that's not a smart move. I, yeah. I, I get it. There's a lot of stuff I might do for money. That's probably a dumb one. You park in, in the, the hypothetical in the alley. Right. You park in the alley. Yeah. And you put on a wool cap and gloves. Uh, in the hypothetical, I put on a cap and gloves. Right. Yeah. And um, you reached under the seat for? Um, a knife. I always kept a knife in the car for the crazies and stuff because you can't travel with a gun. And I remember Charlie saying, you ain't bringing that. And I didn't, right? But I believe he took it. Charlie took the knife? Yeah. In the book. Yeah. Yes. So. The back gate, you go through the back gate. Yes. And it was open or broken or? I don't recall. Okay. I go to the front and I'm looking to see what's going on. Um, 
And I can see that it appears like Nicole had, fly, I had candles all the time. She really did to keep her overhead down, I think. And music was on. And uh, while I was there, a guy shows up. You know? So Ron Goldman comes in the back gate. Yeah. I, I, a guy that I really didn't recognize. I, I may have seen him around, but I really didn't recognize him to be anyone. And, uh, and I, in the mood I was in, I started having words with him. He says to you, I just came by to return a pair of glasses. Judy left them at the restaurant. Yeah, words to that effect, yes. And, and uh, he was I out. don't know if I believe it or didn't believe it. Uh, it was pretty much immaterial because, you know, uh, I was more concerned about everything that, that, everything that was going on, you know, and uh, was uh, fed up with it, I guess. And, uh, All right, Chase, what do you got? It starts off with him saying in the hypothetical. And I think this suggests a couple of things. He wants it to be repeated a whole bunch of times. So maybe when we give our opinions at the end, there'll be hypothetical opinions of what we think happens, since that's a protective phrase, magic protection phrase. Good idea. But I think I think this uh, suggests there's a different version of events by his tone that is accurate and probably similar. And then he says in the hypothetical again which suggests of an existing narrative that's just playing along with what we're seeing here. And when he says Charlie took the knife, uh, he says in the book here, but nowhere else. And this might suggest his disagreement with this. And if he's guilty, he took the knife himself. So this might be a distancing statement. And I think that's a very interesting thing to note there when he's saying I I go to the front and I'm looking to see what's going on. He accidentally shifts into the present moment when he says looking. The interviewer might have caused this, but keep in mind when you listen to this question again, the interviewer didn't directly put him into present, which is where the interviewer is saying, okay, so you're going inside and what do you see now? Like that wasn't necessarily done there. And he does this again a few times. And when he says a, a guy I didn't recognize, his eye home goes to genuine recall. He squints his eyes while he's trying to recognize Goldman in his statement. And I think this suggests a very genuine recall and a genuine memory because he's saying I didn't recognize him. He's squinting and he looks confused like he doesn't recognize a person. But then the interviewer uses a present tense word, which is helpful in many cases to get people into the memory a little bit deeper. Interrogators use it. Therapists use it. So there's genuine recall here and facial expression movement that matches everything in the story. So his face is is narrating the story with him. And I think through the difficulty with memory and the concern with what all is happening here, his behavior suggests a very, very truthful recall. What we're seeing here, most of it. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Everything he's talking about, he's talking about it at, like it happened. He didn't say, if I was going to do this, I would have done this. If this is supposed to be hypothetical, it doesn't sound very hypothetical as he explains it. Because he doesn't say, if I was going to do it, I would have done this. And I would have to have done that. And if we did this, we would have have to have done this, or I would have done this. But he says, I did this. I remember this happened. Here's how I did this. Everything is in the wrong spot as far as uh, where he should place himself in the story. If it's hypothetical, it should have been from a tactical point of view, not from the, the ease of flowing through what actually happened. And I'm going to sit there on that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, turn the sound off here. <clears throat> Go back to the baseline video at the beginning of this. I think it's number eight. Turn the sound off and tell me what's different. I think you're going to find this looks like a guy telling his story in baseline. There are a handful of things that he does differently here. Up front, he does sacred space where he's got his hands crossed and his hands together, and he starts milling his fingers, and his, his calf rises. Something's going on. That's when he's trying to say, look, this is hypothetical. But then he gets amused, and he goes back into it. And when he says Charlie and the knife, he gets emotional accessing again. He illustrates with his eyes. He's doing everything he normally does. And then he gets to, I do not recall, he, you know, he, he misses something there. But he does upright visual memory accessing, like the shoes and the recitals when he talks about walking across the front yard. That's alarming. 
if this is hypothetical and he's recalling something he's seen, you go back and look at those baselines, there's something there. He, all the illustrators and all the adapters and all these things are telling the story correctly. He shows emotion and concern, chased dead on about this guy Goldman. His brow goes up, he's showing con some concern there. And then he goes back down to emotion. His jaw starts to work. There's some residual emotion there. And then he kind of goes to this anger thing where he puts his chin down, his head down, and he's telling with words. And then he says, fed up. Guys, this one, if you go back and look at his baseline, this looks like a guy telling a story. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. Calm body language, pleasure when he's tell in the face, when he's telling this story. Illustrators, symmetrical, he's being honest. The only dishonest thing is the word hypothetical, essentially. The, the, the much of what he's saying actually happened, much of it. Um, fed up with it, we see anger in the eyes. Uh, so I think we can start to look now for a motivator here um, and, and, and understand where this comes. This comes early on, uh, being fed up with it. So the anger starts early on. Uh, to, to, to Greg and Chase, your points of, of this guy, did he know this guy? Well, there's some body language to suggest that. And also, could have been anyone, did not recognize, seen him around. You can't have all three. You're not allowed to have all three of those things. Could have been anyone, didn't recognize him, seen him around. Well, then you've probably seen him around, haven't you? You do know who this person is. Um, okay, I uh, believe Charlie took the knife. Well, no, either Charlie took the knife or he didn't take the knife. But you believe he took the knife, but you're certain about other things. Here's the thing about this gnome, Charlie, that springs out of nowhere. If Charlie takes, hypothetically, if Charlie takes the knife, this isn't premeditated. If OJ takes the knife and he's already angry at the point, you've now got premeditated murder and not a crime of passion. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I'm conjecting here and I'm being hypothetical as well. But Charlie would be a useful gnome to spring out of nowhere at this point if you had premeditated based on information and gone into a situation with a knife in your hand. So let's see what happens to this knife story down the road. How well does this knife show up? Is it handled like a knife gets handled when you take it from somebody? Is it handled like you handle a knife when you've taken it along yourself? Because that's an important issue for how we, the public, respond to him. Is he a pre, hypothetically, is he a premeditated murderer or is he somebody involved in a crime of passion with somebody who dresses inappropriately at kids' concerts and hangs around with people like strangers from nowhere. That's the real issue here for me. You park in, in the, the hypothetical in the alley. Right. You park in the alley. Yeah. And you put on a wool cap and gloves. Uh, in the hypothetical, I put on a cap and gloves. Right. Yeah. And um, you reached under the seat for um, a knife. I always kept a knife in the car for the crazies and stuff because you can't travel with a gun. And I remember Charlie saying, you ain't bringing that. And I didn't, right? But I believe he took it. Charlie took the knife? Yeah. In the book. Yeah. Yes. So the back gate, you go through the back gate? Yes. And it was open or broken or? I don't recall. OK. I go to the front, and I'm looking to see what's going on. Um, and I can see that it appears, like Nicole had, fly, I had candles all the time. She really did to keep her overhead down, I think. And music was on, and uh, while I was there, a guy shows up. You know? So Ron Goldman comes in the back gate. Yeah, I, I, a guy that I really didn't recognize. I, I may have seen him around, but I really didn't recognize him to be anyone. And, uh, and I, in the mood I was in, I started having words with him. He says to you, I just came by to return a pair of glasses. Judy left them at the restaurant. Yeah, words to that effect, yes. And, and uh, he was I out. don't know if I believe it or didn't believe it. Uh, it was pretty much immaterial because, you know, uh, I was more concerned about everything that, that, everything that was going on. 
you know, and uh, was uh, fed up with it, I guess. And, uh, you get into a fight, Nicole comes out. A verbal, a verbal, a verbal fight. fight. Got a little loud, and by that time, uh, uh, Nicole had come out, and we started having words about who is this guy, why is he here, what's going on. And, and she says, this is my house, get that the F out yeah, of here. Yes, and uh, which I didn't like because, once again, this is the same person, and if you read the book, you'll see some things that happened in the two weeks leading up to this that were uh, very, very irritating, you know. Uh, and I think Charlie had followed this guy in, one make sure it was no problem, and he brought the knife. As things got heated, uh, I just remember Nicole fell and hurt herself. And uh, this guy kind of got into a karate thing. And I said, well, you think you can kick my ass? And I remember I grabbed a knife. I do remember that portion, taking a knife from Charlie. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember. Except I'm standing there and there's all kind of stuff around and... Um, um, what kind of stuff? Blood and stuff around. You know, we, you know, I hate to say this, but this is not even that. I'm right, sorry. Right. I know we got to back up again. Right. That's <laughs> okay. Know? I want to back this up. This is hard. This is this hard. Is hard. To, yeah, I know. Yeah, I want to back up to... It's hard to try to make people think that I'm... A... <laughs> I, know. I know. I'll go first on this one. This is my opinion. And of course, it's hypothetical, just like everything else OJ's talking about. I think we just heard him confess to murder of, of those two people. That's exactly what it sounds like. He talks about it, it like he walked through it. He doesn't talk about it in a hypothetical sense. Would have hap what would have happened was this. What would have happened was that. He just told us he murdered those people. That's my opinion, and that's my hypothetical opinion along there with OJ. Um, that's what I think's happening there. I'm going to leave it there. All right, Chase, what do you got? Yeah. So there's a whole lot here. There's genuine recall. Uh, let's just look at right at the beginning when he says very interesting, genuine frustration, a micro expression of anger. We know that it's genuine because it happens at the precise moment that he's talking about being irritated. There's a huge difference of those micro expressions either matching up or not. And when he says this karate thing, Ron Goldman was an actual third degree black belt, I think. And it's interesting. OJ took uh, knife fighting only two months prior to this happening. He actually was trained in knife combat. And there's some genuine glabella movement when he's saying, do you think you can kick my ass? And there's truthful recall about taking control of the knife from Charlie or taking the knife. And there's all kinds of stuff around when he's saying stuff instead of blood. I think he's uncomfortable talking about blood because he likely saw it in real life. And it's well known that he had a, a problem with blood. If it was a real event, mentioning or recalling it would be uncomfortable. And if it was written in a book, it would not be uncomfortable. So when he finally mentions blood, there's visual movement uh, in the eyes for a, a visual scene. So his eyes kind of go up to that. And if it was hypothetical and you wrote a book about it, this would look wildly different, wildly different. Uh, according to me, hypothetically, that's my opinion. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. I'm going to point out a couple of things. He does show anger. He illustrates with his whole body. He's telling a story just like he did in the baseline. Go all the way back and look. He's got some downright eye accessing as he describes things that are going on. Here's the key. He talks about attacking Ron Goldman with a knife but Nicole hurt herself. We never hear another thing about Nicole. What happened after Ron Goldman? Did he get in a rage and kill her too in the hypothetical? Well, we know that most people who harm others soften severity and they say hurt himself, was murdered, that kind of thing. This sounds an awful lot like, well, I don't owe that guy anything. He's a guy, he could have been anybody, but I do owe her something and it gets awfully quiet. And it, that paired with the fact all of his illustrators, all of his adapters, everything he's doing fit and anger at the right time and residual emotion sure make this look like a real story and not like something he wrote down in the book. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, one thing on this, he does put pressure on the idea that he did take the knife from Charlie. It's, it's, an, it's a 
interesting stress, I think. Why does he need to, I think, say it twice and put stress on that? I think there's an L. So that's interesting. And, and I don't disagree that there may be some, some truthful recall around that chase. I worry about the words that he uses around that. And then we hear several slaps on the chair to see people off of that area and self-soothing with his thumb on the chair. Now, this could be genuine recall of the event and it's truly troubling for him. Why wouldn't it be? Or it could be that that is inaccurate, what he's talking about there. And why would that be important? In my mind, though, I'm not a lawyer, but hypothetically, if I was, I would be saying you don't want a story where you decided this act before you'd shown up and you took a knife into that garden. It's got to just show up. Yeah. So, so I worry. I get what you're saying there, Chase, and I still worry ab about it there. There, that's all I got on that. You get into a fight, Nicole comes out. And a verbal, a verbal, a verbal fight. fight. Got a little loud, and by that time, uh, uh, Nicole had come out. And we started having words about who is this guy, why is he here, what's going on. And, and she says, this is my house, get that the F out yeah, of here. Yes, and uh, which I didn't like because once again, this is the same person. And if you read the book, you'll see some things that happened in the two weeks leading up to this that were uh, very, very irritating, you know. Uh, and I think Charlie had followed this guy in, one make sure it was no problem, and he brought the knife. As things got heated, uh, I just remember Nicole fell and hurt herself. And uh, this guy kind of got into a karate thing. And I said, well, you think you can kick my ass? And I remember I grabbed the knife. I do remember that portion, taking the knife from Charlie. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember. Except I'm standing there and there's all kind of stuff around and... Um, um, what kind of stuff? Blood and stuff around. You know, we, you know, I hate to say this, but this is like, but that, oh, I'm right, sorry. Right. I know we got to back up again. Right. That's <laughs> you know? okay. I'm going to back this up. This is hard. This is this hard. Is hard. To, I know. know. I'm going to back up to... It's hard to try to make people think that I'm... A... <laughs> I, know. I, know. I know. Charlie, the lady in the lake. Charlie, the lake. Well, well, you guys went longer than I thought you were going to go. You wrote in the book, I had never seen so much blood in my life. Covered, you're covered. The scene, can you describe yeah, it? I, I, it's hard for me to describe it. I'm telling you, I don't think any two people could be um, murdered the way they were without everybody being covered in blood. And of course, I think we've all seen the grisly pictures after. So yeah, I think everything was covered. Would have been covered in blood. All right, Greg, what do you got? So we see either a Morse tongue jet or a mouth grooming. Either way, a sign that he's feeling stress. There's real and genuine sadness at so much blood you can't miss it. That distaste at chunk at, with the tongue jut, and then there's a chin boss and a lip pursing going on. So there's some shame or emotion or something going on in his face, and he slows his cadence to a place that I only usually hear just as a person is ready to confess. Those are what I'm looking at, and those are powerful. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, pause of emotion before the word murdered. Um, bottom teeth of anger before that as well. So I think we can attach a motivator to it. Agree with the tongue jut, absolutely. Covered in blood, eyes of anger there. So again, all points towards uh, the emotion of anger around this whole event. Chase, what do you think? Everything's genuine uh, to me. When he's saying so much blood, there's chin boss movement, which indicates shame or guilt, and his chin lowering, which is a protective gesture out of fear. And we see a, a very genuine looking emotional reaction to this instead of just reading from a book. That's all I got. All right, Scott. Um, what do you got? Yeah. Okay. Pretty much the same thing. This is this is one of the first times we see genuine, um, not grief, but but sadness in this and this really bothers him it, it had been an emotional 
spot because like Greg was saying, he slows down and he starts talking slowly about what happened and he's recalling this and he's going through it. The horror of having all that blood around. And it was all over him because he talks about, and this goes against what he said at the beginning when there were, how there couldn't have been any blood. He took a quick shower and all that, but he had to, to take a shower, get that, all that off him and then move forward from there. So I think this is, we're actually seeing true emo emotion from him in this one. You wrote in the book, I had never seen so much blood in my life. Mm, yes. Covered, you're covered, the scene. Can you describe yeah, it? I, I, it's hard for me to describe it, I'm telling you. I don't think any two people could be um, murdered the way they were without everybody being covered in blood. And of course, I think we've all seen the grisly pictures after. So yeah, I think everything was covered, would have been covered in blood. All right. And what goes through your mind at a time like that? I don't know. It's like, uh, what happened? Right. Mm -hmm. You write about removing a glove before taking the knife from Charlie. Uh, you know, I had no conscious memory of doing that, but obviously I must have because they found a the glove there. And blacking out. Have no. you ever blacked out before? Not to my knowledge. No. No. Of course, uh, of course, if something like this would take place in anybody's life, if it were to happen, I would imagine it's something that you would probably automatically uh, have trouble wrapping your, your mind around it. It was horrible. It was absolutely hard. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, the interviewer, bitter taste in the mouth. I talk about bitter taste a lot, and you're just going to see it with a little indents here. There is something really distasteful for her around this, quite obviously. And, um, and then she does a hard swallow as well. So there's potentially some stress around this, quite obviously. Her eyes go down. Is that because of his dominance or is she, she showing, showing social disdain? Let's move on a little bit and work out which one. He counters with a plea. It was horrible. So he's trying to have an alibi. Look, this was a horrible thing for me as well. Feel pity for me. And then we see a micro display of, I would say, disdain from him. The pity didn't work. I think she shows him disdain and horror, horror then disdain by looking away. He pleads for pity. She doesn't pity him. He displays disdain for her. That's why I think we don't like him in this situation because unconsciously we'll be picking up his disdain for her disdain. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, he starts off with, I don't know, and he moves his head in what you expect, very short strokes when a person's uncertain because they're not going to go, no, 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 that's certainty. I don't know what's happening. He, his head is down and to the right. That's where he's living now. His head is actually starting to get heavy and pulling his body over. And that happens when you get to a very emotional state. And he left eye accesses, again, back to baseline. It looks a little different because his head is down, but he does this. Back up left eye access and go back and look. Every time he does that, it's a visual question and he's answering. Answering. He has a fleeting emotion in his face in a way you don't typically see in adults and sophisticated people, which OJ clearly is. You see it in children before they understand controlling emotion. There'll be a mix of emotions flush across their face and fleet, and it's hard to even catch them. If you took this and slowed it down, you would see a lot of confusion and anger and all of those things. He shows a lot of different emotions there, and then he is now moved to a point where he can't get out of that emotional piece. And he says, wrapping his mind around it. And then when he's asked a question about the blood and all of that, he does the brave face. That's the brave face smile when somebody's dealing with a very complex thing. You've seen it all the time when somebody's dealing with a complex thing in their life and you ask them and they go, everything's okay. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you guys. I think he accidentally begins to use distancing language here. And this is important because I think he forgets the hypothetical part. And he's using the distancing language for his own comfort and not to appear to be innocent. So this is a rare case when we're going to see something like that, when he's trying to keep it hypothetical and using distancing language. And there's a lot of language here. He uses, I'll just say this one thing. He uses body narration, which is where he illustrates a story that he's trying to do something and he shows it with his hands. 
which is his baseline for truth in every other video to illustrate the difficulty of wrapping his mind around exactly what had just happened and what's actually going on. So we're seeing the hallmarks of his truthful behavior uh, while he's describing this whole thing and how horrible it was. And his, the only other thing here that really stuck out was his blink rate skyrockets to about the mid eighties during this. Scott, what do you got? I think the most important thing here is where she says, have you ever blacked out before? And he says, what? Not to my knowledge. How many times have you heard somebody say, not to my knowledge, and they weren't being honest with you? OJ is famous for, for having this temper that just pops off in a rage and just going off. If you watch those uh, documentaries about him, and they'll, there'll be somebody in there each time that says, uh, that it, that he had problems with anger. They had, had an anger problem uh, that stemmed from when he was younger and some other things that happened, uh, you know, from being a thug as a kid or whatever. So I think he did black out, and that's because and and that's because he said um, I don't recall. But that's when all that happened. Hypothetically, is if he did black out, that's happened before. And he's going through that again, and that kind of scares him. I think it bothers him. We're seeing, again, we're seeing more true emotion here, and he's reliving this as he's going through it. He would have said it would have been horrible, but he says it was horrible. So I think he, we're just, we're just, he's not even, I don't even think he's trying anymore. He's just going right through it and telling us what happened. And what goes through your mind at a time like that? I don't know. It's like, what happened? Right. Mm -hmm. You write about removing a glove before taking the knife from Charlie? Uh, you know, I had no conscious memory of doing that, but obviously I must have because they found a glove there. And blacking out? Have no. you ever blacked out before? Not to my knowledge. No. No, of course, you... uh, of course, if something like this would take place in anybody's life, if it were to happen, I would imagine it's something that you would probably automatically uh, have trouble wrapping your your mind around it. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. All right. Then you see bloody footprints and you decide to take off. Yes. Actually, I, I believe Charlie kept saying, we got to get out of here. And in the book, you describe taking off your shoes, your pants and your shirt and dropping it in a bundle. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. And do you remember what happened? Because what are you going to do with it? <laughs> you know, somebody's got to get rid of, uh, as you may have called during the trial, is that where are the bloody clothes? So somebody had to get rid of the bloody clothes. Right. And you had left your keys and wallet in your pants pocket and you had to go back and get it? You know, to be honest, uh, I think I, I know that to be true, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and Charlie is hysterical, sc screaming, Jesus Christ, OJ, Jesus Christ. And you tell him to yeah, shut up? Yeah, he's in a panic. He was in a panic. And I'm telling him to shut up. Let's get out of here. So you get back in the car. You take in your clothes, put them yeah, in the bundle. and drove back and, and uh, parked a block away because I knew the limo would be there and came across the backyard through the two tennis courts and, you know, came through the house. Um, so you went through the neighbors? Neighbors, yeah. He had a tennis court, then I had a tennis court. And you go into the house. And what happens in the house? I, 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 I ran upstairs to take a shower. I actually ran upstairs and took some of my bags and came back downstairs and put them out front. All right, Chase, what do you got? When he says, uh, to be honest, I know that to be true. I think that's that's it. There's some factual conveyance in the globello there and then kind of realizes there's a mistake. And he makes a facial expression we see in Paul Ekman's research for embarrassed or social guilt. The lips are kind of pulled back. The eyes roll up a little bit and there's an eyebrow flash. And he shifts again back to the present when he's saying Charlie is being hysterical. He is in a panic. And when he's doing this backyard thing, going through the tennis courts, he's spatially oriented and he's narrating with his hand again, his baseline. And it's even uh, if he's spatially oriented person, it might be a coincidence, but his neighbor's house is to the east. So as if he's looking at a map or as if he's looking at a map of his neighborhood, he's moving in that direction and kind of going across from one tennis court to the other. And 
when he says, uh, ran upstairs, take a shower, he edits that and then adds more details for greater accuracy. And I think that's the one thing that tells it is he's not talking about what's in the book uh, at all is what it looks like to me, hypothetically. Scott, what do you think? We, every time Charlie comes up, we see an adapter. Charlie equals adapters because he's guarding that so hard, not to say that guy's name, the real person's name, that was a part of that. He doesn't want to implicate them in this at all because they got away with it at this point. So every notice every time Charlie comes up, he either bites his lip, he'll squeeze his hand, he'll take a deep breath, his nostrils will flare. Every time that guy's name comes up because he says, he, when he f refers to Charlie, he says he was somebody he just met. No, nah, this was one of his old friends, I think. When he talks about um, taking the knife from him, those things, he makes sh that's when he's on point for all those things. That's the only time he really comes around and makes sure he's on point for making sure we don't find out who that person is at that point. I have a whole lot more to go with it, but Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to tell you this one makes me wonder because there is a huge deviation from baseline in this video. Now, you would think he would be doing the same exact storytelling he had done about the murder, but he isn't. Every time he's asked a visual cue, every time he's asked a question, he right eye accesses, which is not his norm. We know he's going left for, for memory so far. But when he does this, it makes me go, why, why is he doing that? Now, he does do some emotional eye accessing, and that shame that you're showing, Chase, I think he does it when he's asked a question they should know the answer to, and he doesn't. So my brain wants to try to conjecture and figure that out, but that's not what we do. We don't try to read his mind. We just know that he is breaking his baseline here. So it feels like something about this part of the story is not true, whatever it is. And it doesn't look as believable as when he was telling a story about the murder. Maybe it's because he hasn't thought of it. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's altogether that all this is a lie. And this is a place that he has not worked out the details because that look of is kind of him asking for did that sound okay? Is what it is. You can see it. Request for approval, all that social guilt, all that stuff at the same time. Mark, what do you got? This one makes me concerned about the whole story. So, so I would say here's a potential here. For some people, the truth will set you free. And that moment of freedom for him could be causing a deviation in his baseline. He's leant right forward into this confession potentially right now. And that's this is a new body language for him, right forward into it. For some people, the truth is hard to face. And you see that with the interviewer who is lent right back out of it. So, you know, one thing that comes out for me is a very different feeling around this story between him and the interviewer. Then you see bloody footprints and you decide to take off. Yes, actually, I, I believe Charlie kept saying, we gotta get out of here. And in the book, you describe taking off your shoes, your pants, and your shirt and dropping it in a bundle. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. And do you remember what happened? Because what are you going to do with it? <laughs> you know, somebody's got to get rid of, uh, as you may have called during the trial, is that wear the bloody clothes. So somebody had to get rid of the bloody clothes. Right. And you had left your keys and wallet in your pants pocket, and you had to go back and get it? You know, to be honest, uh, I think I, I know that to be true. Yes. Yes. Um, and Charlie is hysterical, sc screaming, Jesus Christ, OJ, Jesus Christ. And you tell him to yeah, shut up. Yeah, he's in a panic. He was in a panic. And I'm telling him to shut up. Let's get out of here. So you get back in the car. You take in your clothes, put them yeah, in the bundle. And drove back and, and uh, it parked a block away because I knew the limo would be there and came across the backyard through the two tennis courts and, you know, came through the house. Uh, so you went through the neighbors? Neighbors, yeah, he had a tennis court, then I had a tennis court. And you go into the house, and what happens in the house? I, 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 I ran upstairs to take a shower. I actually ran upstairs and took some of my bags and came back downstairs and put them out front. Did you kill Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman? Absolutely not. I couldn't kill anyone. I couldn't do it. You know, one of the things that probably saved my life when I was in that orange grove was that my mother always told me that people who commit suicide can't go to heaven. I expect, hopefully, I pray that one day I'll see Nicole again. I have no doubt that's where she is. I couldn't kill anybody. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, just one thing. Absolutely not. 
We we talk about this a great deal. It doesn't mean somebody's a liar, but if you put that together with I couldn't kill anyone, that has disassociated it from the two people who were murdered here. And so those two things together, I don't like the look of those. Chase, what do you got on this one? We see some deceptive stuff here, Mark, that you talked about. But a lot of what we're looking at here uh, looks well rehearsed and polished and beautiful. It looks as though maybe someone had written this. There's fluid movement. It's a, there is a confident denial. Uh, and there's a whole lot here. There's, he's comfortable using the term kill and he's comfortable using her name. Uh, and the strongest accessing is at genuine contemplation of whether he would be going to heaven or not, or whether or not he should say that. So one of those things is, is most likely the case. So it was an interesting video here. And we're seeing some baseline and one or two deviations from it. Greg? Yeah, you now know what OJ's old baseline and new baseline is. So now you should have picked up a lot of these things. But he still has a self-image, still had his handlers at this point. He's maintaining that image. He does front of the mouth talking. He's not telling. He's very, very plaintive, trying to get information. You might expect him to be angry here, but this is two years later after he's been through court and, 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 and. He's making a hell of a lot of eye contact for OJ. If you watch the rest of this video, he's not illustrating. So he's persuading, whether that's good or bad, different story. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, we have, let's go back to illustrators. This is the most, for me, it's the most important uh, video we've got on here because when you're, when you're, when you illustrate, when your brain is emphasizing specific words or phrases, like I just did, did just then specific words or phrases, they land on the words. And like I said at the very beginning, they should happen on the words, not like this. And if you'll listen, when he says, I couldn't do it, he's hitting that table, but the hits come after he says each word. Then he smiles. Killing somebody, talking about killing your ex-wife and someone else is not funny. And there's no reason in the world to smile about that. With those things being off, those illustrators being off, and you listen for those taps and you'll see. And then him smiling and sort of laughing about that, that tells me something's not right there. And I think we know what that something is. Did you kill Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman? Absolutely not. I couldn't kill anyone. I couldn't do it. You know, one of the things that probably saved my life when I was in that orange grove, was that my mother always told me if people who commit suicide can't go to heaven. I expect, hopefully, I pray that one day I'll see Nicole again. I have no doubt that's where she is. I couldn't kill anybody. So let's talk about this for a second. Mark, what do you think is an overall is happening here? Well, look, I mean, the main thing for me is if you want to go back and watch a video that would cause an expert in human behavior and body language to throw down their pen, run around the room and go, what on earth is going on here? Then go back to that video where Charlie is first mentioned. It's bonkers as far as I'm concerned. Chase, what do you think? Yeah, I think when you see these two wildly different times in OJ's life, it gets stunningly easy to contrast this behavior. And granted, time changes our baselines, but not that much. Our objective here was to show these two different things, and Greg's brilliant idea to do this. The biggest takeaway for me is that if there's a vanishing perpetrator, which means I'm not redirecting the conversation to who actually did the murder and OJ isn't guilty, this means that there is a large degree of protection around whoever did do it. So there's either extreme guilty knowledge or some actual guilt. Both of those things have a vanishing perpetrator uh, ailment associated with them. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, when I first watched this, the jury's out for me because I looked and said, I, I'm just gonna run through it at double speed. I picked the videos that had him walking through things. When he was prepared and had somebody driving him, he was very together. His denials were very artistic, his chaff and redirect. Once he got to this next one, once you compare his baseline to him telling the story, it's not a good look, OJ. And if he's pulling this off, maybe he deserved an Oscar for one of those movies he was in, Mark. It's my opinion that this is pretty damning. Scott, what do you got? I agree with you 100%. I think we're, we're seeing somebody admit to this is all hypothetical. Just like what OJ is saying. In the hypothetical sense, Just I would opinion. say, in my opinion, I would say that he did this. He admits to doing it. And he puts everything in the, uh, in, in, in 
the perfect tense to do that with as he's talking about it. Also, I think the person, this guy, Charlie, who he says was there with him, I think that, and I'm just, just hypothetical. I could be, you know, I could be totally wrong and probably am wrong, but I think it was somebody who's really close to him. And I think it, was, it might have been that, should I say the name or not? No. Lady okay. in the Lake. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, anyway, I think it was one of his best friends, most likely. That's where or somebody very close to him, maybe not one of his best friends, somebody he's known a long time because he made sure to say he just met that person and, and he named him Charlie. And every time Charlie comes up, we, we, we see th- adapters that let us know that something's up there and that he's trying not to get near that or say that guy's name. If you'd like to learn even more about body language and human behavior, watch this video.